Look, I have a problem. I'm gay now. And hold on, it wasn't always like this. See, I used to be a normal 10 year old boy. You know, I loved monster trucks, playing Pokemon after school, uh, often fantasizing about uh, being a girl and hoping I would randomly wake up in a different body and felt like I didn't quite fit into my skin, but didn't really have the words to style, express how I felt. Uh, and of course, logging hundreds of hours under the newly released Minecraft. Now, I believe this is all a ploy by the woke mob injecting their liberal ideals into my Saturday morning cartoons. And maybe, just maybe, if I look at these childhood memories, I'll be able to get to the bottom of all of this, once and for all. Well, all right, let's see if anything's on. Before we look at any of these episodes, I think I should explain just what it is I'm looking for here. Luckily, we have the handy dandy, arbitrary, definitely subject to change, five point scale I dubbed the gendometer. Now, my gendometer was designed specifically as a way to evaluate the contents of a gender-bending cartoon episode. Needless to say, it hasn't really uh, taken off in the scientific world yet, but, uh, but, but regardless, I think it'll be a huge help here. What comprises the scale are five different categories, each ranging from zero to one points, with each looking at a different aspect of an episode. Firstly, we have did the bend actually make sense in context of both the show and the individual episode. Next, is the story of the episode actually good, or does it make no sense? Do the jokes still hold up? I mean, you'd be surprised. Some of the stuff is even funnier now than it was back then. Is there a good lesson or moral to take away at the end of the episode? Which, personally, I think is the most important part of the scale. But lastly, how much do I want to be them? You know, every good study has heavy bias involved. After giving a plot summary, along with some analysis of said episode, we will refer back to the gendometer and figure out each episode's overall score. Finally, I want to add that there are a ton of gender bending episodes and I will most likely miss out on some huge ones, but it's important to understand that we're specifically looking at episodes that I remember from my childhood. So if there's any that you remember a little too fondly, absolutely leave them in the comments below. With all that said, let's finally get into the first episode. The Boyhood Become Queen, I think, is easily one of the most memorable and recognizable gender mini episodes of any cartoon in this era. We first get introduced to the main bit of this episode, which is that to nerds like Timmy and his friends, girls are quite literally speaking a whole different language. We learn in this opening segment that firstly, Timmy loves soap operas, but more importantly, that Trixie is having a birthday party the following day and the gang wants to get invited. Timmy promises Trixie that he'll bring her a really great gift, so she invites the four of them to the party. When Timmy gets home, he tries to think of what Trixie would want as a gift, but he simply can't understand the mind of a girl. And honestly, I'm right there with him. Cosmo jokingly suggests that if Timmy wants to understand what a girl would want, he could just wish to be one, which then leads to Timmy saying the iconic words. I think I'd wish I was a girl! <laughs> Despite it being said in a joking manner, he still technically did make a wish, which leads to Wanda fulfilling that wish, turning Timmy into a girl. He's obviously upset about this, and Cosmo drops the funniest line in the entire episode to make fun of him. What you think you're a girl now <laughs> however after realizing that he thinks like a girl now he decides to use it to his advantage in order to find the perfect gift for trixie i think this is a great use of the gender bending trope and it gives us a real reason of why he didn't just instantly wish to go back after more heckling from cosmo and wanda before he leaves he wishes that both of them swap genders giving us cosma and wando once at the mall, Timmy decides to go to the comic book store because muscular guys fighting in spandex is cool. Meanwhile, AJ and Chester are watching as a girl enters the comic book store. And I'll be honest, a lot of you guys have been like this in my comments. But I'm gonna stare at her until she feels so awkward, she has to talk to me. What? Once at the store, Timmy grabs a comic book, only for it to turn into an altercation with someone else trying to buy the same issue. Once Timmy snatches it away, it's revealed that the person trying to buy the comic book is actually Trixie in disguise. Here's where we learn a little bit more about Trixie's character. See, she likes boy things like comics and video games, but she's too worried about her friends finding out, and seeing Timmy, who now goes by Samantha, be into the same stuff makes her more comfortable with being seen. We then see them go into a salon, where Trixie says, Never come in here. He should if boys did more girl stuff and girls would be able to do more boy stuff. Which leads Samantha to leave with her. The two then go around the mall doing various boy activities and Trixie couldn't be happier. She then tells Samantha that all she really wants for her birthday is someone who would be her friend regardless of what she's into. We then cut to the next day at Trixie's party and Timmy, who is Timmy again, gives her the one thing she wanted more than anything. A friend. So of course she launches him out of her mansion, but not before saying his name, which is all he wanted all along. The episode ends with Timmy coming to realization that girls are people too, and often deal with the same struggles that guys do, but just in different ways. The final scene has Timmy back in the salon from earlier, making friends with all the middle-aged women there, as one does. 
There's a basic plot synopsis, now let's break out the genometer and really look into the five aspects of a good gender bender that I mentioned earlier. Firstly, does the bend make sense? I think it absolutely does. Not only is there an in-universe explanation, that being the I wish phrasing, but also in terms of resolving the major conflict of the episode, it works out great. Now how is the story of this episode? Eh, it could have been better. With this only being a 12 minute episode, there's not too much expanding you could really do. However, I don't know how much more you really could have said if we had the full 24, so I'll give this a 0.5. Are the jokes good? Yeah, the jokes are still really good. Some aren't as funny, but I think the Fairly Odd Parents have always done a great job in the comedy aspect, especially with its cutaways. <coughs> is there a good moral or lesson to take away? Once again, I absolutely think there is. In my opinion, the lesson boils down to girls can like boy things and boys can like girl things. Basically, they're saying that their norms are kind of dumb. And now the most important question, do I want to be them? Eh, not all that much. When I was younger, definitely more, but for now, I'll give it a solid 0.5. Adding these totals up into our denominator, we're left with a strong 4 out of 5 score. This episode just works really well all around, and I think the bend being used not exclusively in a comedic way, which a lot of cartoons do, and more to push the plot further, works really well. With that, I think that Boy Who Would Become Queen is the absolute gold standard when it comes to gender bending episodes, and I can't wait to see what's on the next block. Codename Kids Next Door, an absolute classic that I don't hear enough people talk about, has a very unique gender bending episode titled Operation Future. Now, if you saw my previous video, you may remember that I alluded to an episode of KND in the final segment of said video. However, that is a different episode titled Operation Support, which I may cover at some point. Today, however, the future is now, and I'm just gonna just uh, cover the episode now. Uh, Operation Future begins with number four getting sent off to boarding school by his parents in order to improve his behavior. Now, he is quite notorious for breaking out of these boarding schools, however, this one has a twist. It's an all-girls boarding school, and the director, Margaret, achieves this by using her girlifying rifle to turn rowdy boys into obedient girls. Number 4 learns this the hard way, as he barely dodges the blast, leaving his left hand girlified, and then catches wind of Margaret's ultimate plan, turn every boy on the planet into girls. He starts to call up the rest of K&D, informing them of the emergency, but then decides that this is something that he has to do alone. So he breaks into Margaret's office while she's on a call with a mysterious old lady. Now you're gonna have to fucking uh, bear, bear with me here as I try to explain the future part of this episode. Number four knocks Margaret to the ground, revealing that she was actually a mech operated by a younger Margaret who was just on the phone with a future Margaret discussing their, or like, her plans to take over the world. Number four is then ambushed by a bunch of soldiers with girlifying rifles and is forced to escape, while Margaret reveals the whole school was actually another mech the whole time and begins to chase him. He tries to call up the rest of KND for real this time, only for it to be revealed that Margaret was aware of this and time traveled in order to girlify the rest of the main five. Yes, even numbers three and five who were already girls. Fast forward 75 years. Yeah. Basically, Margaret was successful in quite literally weaponizing femininity and turned almost the entirety of the population into girls. The boys that were left behind formed the BND, aka the boys next door, and planned to take revenge on Margaret. Number four's grandchild Sally hands over her rifle to the BND in order for them to reverse engineer it and put the world back to normal. They're very untrusting of her at first. However, an old number four allows her to stay and help them. With her help, they make the fucking boy rifle or whatever and launch an attack on Margaret's castle, in which they are successful because this older number four actually jumps back in time before the gang gets girlified to warn them of the impending doom. They save the day and we jump back to 75 years later where boys and girls live happily ever after and K and D is successful. Now, compared to the previous episode I watched, this one is less of a gender bending episode and more of an episode that uses the idea of gender bending as a driving force behind the main villain scheme. Regardless, I think it plays with the idea of gender in a fun and creative way. Like I said earlier, literally weaponizing masculinity and femininity. But alright, let's pull out the trustworthy and yet to be FDA approved genometer and see how this episode stacks up. Firstly, I think the bend, or rather various gender bends, makes sense in the k and universe. I mean, they have all kinds of wacky shit, that's what makes the show so fun. Despite my rushed explanation, I think the story of this episode actually really works. Their execution of time travel isn't like completely flawless or anything, but I really enjoyed how they set up their own like apocalypse type thing. The jokes in the episode were alright. Operation Future is definitely less of a comedic episode and really sets up the idea of gender bending as something to be worried about, not as a punchline like many other examples. The moral of the episode was for sure a good one. Basically, if boys and girls set aside their differences and work together, the future will turn out better for everyone and it's portrayed in a really interesting way. However, where the episode falls completely flat, 
I, I don't want to be any of them. And I can't believe the episode's writers did not take this into account. Personally, I've always wanted to be number three, but she doesn't get too much screen time here compared to number four. So I'll give it a zero on the final category. Overall, this leaves us with a 3.5 out of 5, and I think that's a very respectable score. They played with the idea of gender bending in a wholly unique way, and I absolutely think this episode is worth giving a rewatch if you loved K and D growing up. Well, two pretty good episodes back to back. Let's keep this ball rolling. What's on next? Oh, god damn it. My first note for Johnny Tess's very O gender bending episode is I am not looking forward to this one. Let's be so real for a sec. If you're trans and hear gender bending Johnny Tess episode, your mind immediately went to this scene. Unfortunately, that's only like a two second bit in a completely unrelated episode. Now, if you're not trans and your mind still went there, I got some horrible news for you. Look, do not watch I Saw the TV Glow. Anyways, Roller Johnny follows Johnny and his dog Dookie. Yeah, that's his name. Definitely uh, forgot his name was Dookie. Uh, as they're watching TV and Johnny's favorite show comes on, Slamorama. The host of the show poses a challenge to the viewers. If any team of two women are able to get in the rink and beat the reigning champion, they'll win lifetime tickets to the amusement park and $1,000 cash. Hearing this, Johnny is dead set on getting those tickets. However, Dookie points out a very serious flaw in Johnny's plan. Yeah, except he said roller girls. You boy, me dog. And besides, we don't have any roller derby skills. So it's off to the lab, where they an offer to Susan and Mary. Basically, if they can get Johnny and Dookie roller derby skates and outfits, they'll get the entirety of the cash prize. Susan and Mary are willing to go along with this and give the boys what they need, but that still leaves the problem of them not being girls. Luckily, Susan and Mary have a gender bender lying around and are more than eager to let Johnny and Dookie test it out. One button press later, and boom, we have Joni and Darcy, and these are certainly some designs. I'm not gonna lie. I was definitely worried about the whole trans women and women's sports jokes that would probably come out of this episode, but surprisingly, there aren't really any that I can tell. I mean, Joni and Darcy went easily not because their genders are swapped, but because they're literally just cheating with all the tech that Susan and Mary put in their outfits and skates. After winning, Darcy skates malfunction and shock her, causing her to forget everything prior to the match, and she signs a deal with this business guy to keep her roller derby career going. Obviously, Johnny, who is Johnny again, doesn't like this and wants to get his friend back, so he thinks that he just needs to remind Darcy of all the good times they had together. All of these various attempts fail. Oh honey. I don't want your lame autograph, Dookie. It's me, Johnny. So he and his sisters come up with a plan. Swap Johnny back to a girl, challenge Darcy in the rink, then push her back into the gender bender to swap her back to Dookie. After some struggling, they both end up in the machine and his sisters turn both of them back to normal. We end on a scene of Johnny and Dookie at the amusement park happily ever after. This was the shortest episode I watched, but let me tell you, watching an episode of Johnny Test as a non-child is not an easy feat. There are so many sound effects, wit pans, and just gross gags that made this episode very non-fun to watch. So let's bring out the nodometer and just see how amazing this episode really is. Does the bend make sense? While you could argue this deserves a 1, I'm going to give it a 0.5. Now, in context of the universe, I'm not surprised that Susan and Mary just have a gender bending machine. However, I just don't like that they did it purely for Johnny to win a competition. Like I said, there aren't any of those like trans sports jokes, but they were like right on the edge. Surprisingly, the story's not very good. Granted, this is a 10 minute episode, I just don't think it has a very fun or unique plot, especially compared to what we've seen thus far. The jokes? Yeah, there were like one or two I kind of liked, so it'll manage a 0.5, but this episode wasn't all that comedic in my opinion. Now, you can check for yourself, I don't recommend it, but I didn't find any real lesson or takeaway from this episode. I mean, you could say something like, love your best friend, but that's kind of what Johnny Test as a whole is really about, and there's nothing specifically to take away from this episode. Finally, we have what you've all been waiting for, do I want to be them? Honestly, 0.5. Joni kind of grew on me, and having that machine would be pretty useful. Adding everything up leaves us with an outstanding 1.5 out of 5. A sharp decline from our previous two episodes, but like... This is Johnny Test. What did you expect? Before we change the channel, this is the first episode that I changed the pronouns that I used for one of the characters, which in this case was Dookie going from he, him to Darcy was she, her. Now I guarantee that no one really cares when it comes to pronoun usage in this video, but for Tamantha's case, I kept with he, him because Timmy didn't want to be a girl. However, for Darcy, she did. I don't know. I'm not going to get caught up on this stuff for this video. I just thought I'd address it if anyone was wondering. All right, well, let's see what's on after this. Welcome to Goldie's Amazing Commodities. I have some awesome offers for you today. If you want to help support the channel, you can hit the sub, the like, the bell, all those. And if you want to support me monetarily, well, I have the thanks button and this mid-roll. 
if there's no mid roll there, it's gonna be really fucking awkward. And you don't want you don't want to be the guy without watching the mid roll. Like you don't you don't want to be that guy. So let's let's do that again. And you turn off ad block this time. And then. Okay. Spice. The show I remember very vividly from my childhood is the original run of the Powerpuff Girls, and specifically the episode I'll be looking at today, the Rowdy Rough Boys. So this isn't a very traditional gender bending episode at all, but what do I even mean by that? Well, to put it frankly, the girls stay girls. However, we are introduced to the Rowdy Rough Boys, who, as the name imply, are the polar opposites of the Powerpuff Girls, so in a way, they're the gender bent versions of each of the girls. Whatever. I don't control what's on TV, I just watch it, so let's do that. This episode starts out with a montage of Mojo Jojo getting beaten up by the Powerpuff Girls and getting sent to prison over and over again. Eventually he gets tired of this and comes up with the genius idea of creating superpowered children of his own. I need to beat them at their own game. I need to fight fire with fire. I need I need to make a phone call. The only problem is he doesn't know how to do it. So naturally he uses his one prison phone call to call up Professor Utonium and just ask what they're made out of. This plan obviously works flawlessly, and he learns they're made of sugar, spice, everything nice, and of course, a drop of Chemical X. Now, he doesn't want to make his superpowered kids that girlish, so he substitutes the concoction for snips, snails, and a puppy dog tail, with Chemical X coming from the toilet in his cell. Once again, this works flawlessly, and he creates a brick, boomer, and butch, aka the Rowdy Rough Boys, and they have just one goal in mind destroy the Powerpuff Girls. I'm not gonna lie, the bulk of this episode is just the Powerpuff Girls getting beaten up by the Rowdy Rough Boys until they become demotivated and unsure if they're really cut out to be superheroes at all. At their lowest, Miss Bellum comes over to motivate them and just give them a piece of advice on how to beat the boys. So they rush over to Mojo Jojo's tower to lure the boys out and enact their ultimate plan. Just, just kiss them. This works out and causes the Rowdy Rough Boys to combust instantly, once again saving the city of Townsville from Mojo Jojo's evil plan. Now, let's be honest here. I've always seen myself as a Bubbles kind of girl, but as of late, I can get behind Buttercup for sure, and I've always really liked Blossom's bow. Uh, oh, right, the analysis, or whatever, let's pull out the whatever, I don't know. So, despite this not being a literal gender-bending episode, I think the gender-bent versions of the Powerpuff Girls make a lot of sense in-universe. It would only be natural for the opposite ingredients to create the opposite of the Powerpuff Girls, and I think this is a fun way to go about it. Story-wise, I think this is an episode that actually would have benefited from being shorter. We have, like, 12 minutes purely of the Powerpuff Girls, girls getting beat up without any real story progression until the last two minutes. That's kind of why the synopsis was like very quick. There's not much to show. They just get beat up over and over again. However, the jokes in the show are just top notch. Mojo Dojo is always so funny and not to mention this bit with the mayor actually made me laugh. Hello Bubbles. Goodbye Bubbles. Hello Buttercup. Goodbye Buttercup. What kind of pretzels do you think the girls like? A Bavarian or a Thai? I originally had the moral at a 1, but after watching it again, I'd give it a 0.5. I think the overall takeaway is that boys need love too. And obviously this isn't like a bad moral or anything, but this is done in a way of exploiting a weakness and kind of viewed as a cheap tactic rather than something they did out of their own kindness. Finally, do I want to be them? And honestly, 0.5. The Rowdy Rough Boys are kinda sick, and I won't lie, if I met a trans mass named Brick, that would go like kinda crazy. That leaves us with a 3.5 out of 5. I know I kinda blew past this episode, but not a lot happens here. They don't really play with the idea too much outside of what you'd expect. It looks like we only have a few episodes left before these scary adult cartoons come on this evening, so let's change the channel again. This episode of Adventure Time was so popular that it eventually got its own spin-off series a few years later, and that of course is Fiona and Cake. But once again, this technically isn't a true gender-bending episode, as Fiona, Cake, and all the rest of the gender-bent characters in the Land of Ooh are their own characters. However, I think this still counts, and it makes more sense once we see the resolution of this episode. We start out with Fiona and Cake helping out Prince Gumball prepare for his biennial gumball ball. Okay, I fucking got it that time. And it's apparent off the bat that Fiona is interested in going with them. All of a sudden, the Ice Queen breaks through the wall with a slush beast as an attempt to capture the prince. The girls manage to destroy the beast, and while the snow is coming down around them, Prince Gumball asks if Fiona would like to go out with him later, to which Cake says that they'd love to. Once they meet Gumball in the garden, he gives Fiona a bouquet of flowers, and within the bouquet is a crystal sword just for her. They fly around for the whole day, doing various couple-y things, and it all seems to be going well in terms of their relationship. As the sun is setting, Gumball Ball sings a song for him and Fiona, and as the night starts setting in, he invites Fiona to the ball. Not just as a pal this time, 
but instead his girlfriend. She accepts and we're taken back to the treehouse where she gets all dressed up as Cake helps her mentally prepare. Once they arrive at the bowl, Gumball tells Fiona there's something he'd like to show her and takes her up to his room. After shutting the door, it's revealed that the real Prince Gumball had been frozen on the ceiling and that this Gumball was actually the Ice Queen. Since Fiona was dressed for the ball, she didn't bring any of her weapons and the crystal sword that he gave her earlier was actually made out of ice so it melts away instantly. So she has to get creative to fight the Ice Queen and eventually frees Gumball. Cake then rushes in hearing all the commotion and together they're able to defeat the Ice Queen and save the ball. Afterwards, Prince Gumball asks Fiona out for a date, to which she declines, stating, I think the reason I got all these guy friends and no boyfriend is because I don't really want to date any of them. I don't need to feel like I'm waiting to be noticed. I know who I am, and I'll know what I want if and when it ever comes along. And then it's all revealed to have been the Ice King reading a fan fiction he wrote to Finn and Jake while they're trapped in a big ice cube. So the way I see it, this episode is more of a gender bent episode rather than a gender bending episode, I guess. Oh, but then why are you talking about it? Because I think it's cute and silly and fun, all right? I think the bend absolutely makes sense here. It being revealed to be a fan fiction by none other than the Ice King is so funny and completely fits his character. The only point I'll dock is the story. Once again, it's an 11 minute episode, meaning there's not too much time to really flesh things out. However, I don't think that's the main reason. See, when Fiona saves Prince Gumball and the Ice Queen is nowhere to be seen, at least to me, I just thought immediately, oh, so she's pretending to be Gumball. All right. Jokes get absolutely full marks. Adventure Time is just so good at being funny, and there's a lot of moments in this episode that I really enjoy. As I showed, the moral of the episode is along the lines of you don't need a man to feel self-worth, and I think that's a great message. Too often do we have female leads in media that seem to have no greater goal than to get with the guy at the end of the story, and reaffirming that there's more to a person than their love interest is really sick. I like it. And yes, I had absolutely want to be Fiona. She is so cute in this episode. And that leads us to our highest score yet, 4.5 out of 5. And unfortunately, what's on next does not seem like it'll dethrone this episode. Does anyone else remember this show? Because for some reason, I do. Uh, some reason. I remember when I was little, my dad was like, hello, my normal son who will not be affected by this. Let us bond by watching TV together. And I came into the living room and the first episode of She's Out came on. He used to say we watched one episode and then changed the channel. However, this show has been stuck in my mind ever since. So dad, I uh, kind of blame you for all this. Anyways, instead of a one-off gender bending episode, what if there was a whole series dedicated to that very concept? And would it surprise you? That it wasn't very good. She's Out had a 26 episode run spanning from late 2012 to November 2013, and for this video, I decided I was gonna watch a few episodes instead of just one, since you know, the whole show is dedicated to the very topic of my video. Um, I made it through about two and a half episodes before I got tired of it. I'm sure it's an immaculate slow burn that really deserves its. 5.7 out of 10 rating, but I just wanted to get this video out in a timely manner. But enough stalling, I'm going to try to very quickly go over the first three episodes of She's Out. We'll spend the most amount of time looking at the first episode as it sets up everything we need to know about the plot. This episode starts out with us getting introduced to the main characters, Guy, Kelly, and Maz, as Guy and Kelly are moving into their great aunt Agnes's house after she died and left everything to their family. Guy and Kelly are cleaning out the basement when Guy throws something at the wall, revealing a hidden safe. And once they open it, it turns out to be the superhero Shizou's ring inside. Kelly turns out to be Shizou's number one fan and hopes to take the ring for herself. However, Guy ends up taking it from her, putting it on, and saying the phrase that turns him into Shizou. After Kelly is done laughing at him, they then discover Shizou's secret lair hidden behind a mirror. They're informed of a group of villains downtown, but before they go and fight them, Guy decides to test out his new powers. He's got super strength, speed, and a few different tools to help him out during combat. Guy takes out the pirates attacking the town, and here it's revealed that his dad is actually a cop who hates Shizou, as he believes she takes away the credit from the police force. Uh, you cry about it, I guess. The second part of this episode has Guy at Shizou Con, as he prepares to give a speech in front of his adoring fans, and we're introduced to another villain known as Cold Finger. <laughs> He's pretty funny, I, I won't lie. The main episode we learned from this section is that Shizou has one weakness, and that's that if her hair gets messed up, she loses all of her powers and has to grab his hairspray from her utility belt to fix it. She beats Cold Finger by feeding him some spicy food, and the day is saved. Alright, speed run. We gotta do this like three times. Does the bend make sense? Yeah, I mean, he got the ring, gives him powers, but uh oh girl superhero cool makes sense the story is all right i mean for an opening episode it covers everything you need without revealing too much the jokes are also just all right nothing crazy to come over here but i really did like this one come to papa don't you mean mama eh, depends on what i'm wearing there's really no moral at least in this episode and if there was i guess i just missed it do i want to be them kind of i guess the ring would be cool to have 2.5 out of 5 sure that works let's keep going
The first part of episode 2 has Guy and Maz at a store wanting to buy a VR headset, but they don't have enough money. However, just then, she's out since it's danger, and Guy transforms to find out there's a bank robbery going down the street. It's being robbed by a that these guys and she's out comes and saves the day afterward though guy sneaks a 500 dollars bill into his utility belt before the cops arrive to arrest the bad guys guy ends up buying the vr headset with maz and while they're playing guy starts to feel guilty and wants to return the headset however it turns out that there is literal video evidence of guy stealing the 500 dollars and now he has to not only return the console and the money but also destroy the evidence as well you know just like really upstanding superhero stuff one more problem though he starts to shrink uh, because apparently if she's out of something bad, she shrinks until she poofs out of existence. So yeah, he returns the headset, the money, and successfully destroys the tape. Part 2 of this episode is mainly about Maz, and I haven't mentioned this, but one reoccurring bit is Maz is a different sidekick in every episode. But in this one, Guy is just really mean to him for no reason, so he decides to become his own superhero. Maz, obviously not having any superpowers, struggles when the real villain attacks. Magnets and Guy has to bail him out. Later, Kelly explains to Guy why Maz was doing all this, he apologizes for being a bad friend, and yay, the day is saved. I know I'm rushing through these, but you really have to understand that, at least in the episodes I watched, they didn't really use the gender bending bit outside of a few quips, which I'll talk about more in a little bit. The way Guy turns into Shizao still works, makes sense, yep, all good. I gave the story a zero because of how boring it was, Jokes, moral, and beat them are all gonna be 0.5s just because they were like serviceable. And unlike the previous episode, this one had two main lessons don't steal and be nice to your friends. So yeah, 2.5 out of 5 once again. Finally, we get to episode 3. <sighs> Guy goes on to a talk show as she's out, and it turns out there's a surprise guest, an old sidekick of she's out named Tara. She is not happy with she's out and he's here to get her revenge, but then Guy uses some invisibility goop and gets out of there. His dad sees Tara and instead of arresting her, you know, for trying to kill she's out, takes her home for dinner because cops are awesome. Eventually she's out and Tara get into the ring to settle their differences in a lightsaber battle that ends with Guy just yelling at her and winning. It was after this that I decided to not watch anymore. Uh, the other plot of this episode has to do with an evil clone of Shizao or something, but uh, I didn't really get that far. I gave this a 1.5 for the bend and be them again. Okay, but how come we haven't seen another cartoon try to use gender bending as the main crux of the story after she's out aired over 10 years ago? Well, to put it simply, it's just not very funny after like the second time it happens. The main reason in a cartoon like Johnny Test would do a one-off gender bending episode is because it's funny and makes sense in the context of the show. If Johnny went to the gender bender at the start of every episode, uh, well, you know. There are definitely creative ways to use the gender bending trope. I think I showcased that pretty well here, providing a lot of different uses. But across a whole series, I find it hard to believe that they were really able to do more with it outside of the bit here and there. Now, you could argue that maybe Shizai was actually making a statement on LGBTQ rights and the perception of gender. Maybe it was playing with this concept in order to dissolve long-standing beliefs around trans people. But maybe, just maybe, it wasn't doing any of that at all. Yeah, so when this aired, a bunch of like anti-gay blogs and people in general were up in arms about how it was transing our kids and all that, and the creator just straight up said he didn't see it that way. Whether he was being honest or not, this seems to be a sentiment he commonly uses when asked about the trans aspect of the show. And my take? Well, I think he should watch I saw. Sadly, I think if a show like this were made today, even if it was actually good, people would be so pissed about it, whatever network it aired on would probably have to take it off like frame one. Which sucks, because I'm sure there's someone a lot more creative than me out there that can make a concept like She's Out work for more than one episode, but we'll probably never see anything like that. So what did we learn today? After all, I am an educational channel, and I really want that funding for my gendometer. Were gender bending episodes secretly transing our youth the whole time? And no. More likely than not, the kids that were affected by these episodes already had the feeling that something wasn't right, and maybe seeing someone on TV not only change their gender, but then feel uncomfortable in that body really clicked with them. The way I see it, a lot of these types of episodes are perfect depictions of cis people experiencing gender dysphoria. It's kind of weird to think about it that way, because normally you don't associate that with being cis, but if you take a look at the beginning of The Boy Who'd Become a Queen, I think it showcases my point. Timmy, albeit mainly for the sake of comedy here, is very uncomfortable in his new body, and he clearly does not like it. However, unlike Temi, who could just wish to be a boy again, trans people, especially trans youth, don't have that luxury and often have to go years of their life feeling this incredible uncomfortability. I'm not saying that cis people can't experience gender dysphoria in some ways, but you just don't ever hear about it. And I think this is a really interesting lens to look at some of these episodes through. Now, I don't think Butch Hartman was thinking that deep when it came to this episode, but I think that's why it's so fun to look at this stuff like years later. And that goes for majority of these episodes. I don't really think any of them are trying to make some big statement regarding trans people, but regardless, it's something that just comes with the territory, I guess. So yeah, when I was little, I did wish I had fairy godparents for the sole reason to wish I was a girl. But who knows, maybe I did. It just, you know, took them a little while. 
Thanks for watching. Uh, often fantasizing about being a. Oh fuck my wrist! <laughs> oh god damn it! Ow my wrist again! Oh fuck! Let's go gambling. Oh. This is for the house. Why do you want to work twice as hard? Doesn't trip. Doesn't make a mess.